I mean, I was uh, invited to this event, you know. I frankly felt a bit out of place because it was completely solar. And, you know, even though there was a link with solar, you know, always EV and solar have been kept separate. But, you know, it's really good to see that, you know, now there is a synergy that is being seen because ultimately, it's, if solar is the generation part, EV becomes the, is, or is going to become the largest consumption of the energy. So, of course, they come full circle. You know, I'm really happy for that. Uh, you know, when I started, in fact, I'm myself a solar guy who started my career 15 years back with solar. You know, and uh, even now I'm doing that, you know, because, but from a generation point of view, so distributed generation. So, when you talk about the industry before uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID, what I see, or personally what I feel the industry is moving towards is more green technology, but they are segmented, you know. So, we always talk about work package models in solar, right? So, typically, what I feel is the industry is also segmented, but of course, the interconnections are just being created. In fact, I just got off a discussion today where, uh, you know, they want to put uh, EV charging, a large-scale EV charging, but that is not enough load, you know. And then I was surprised to see that they already had solar installed at that, that facility. And then he's still talking about lack of load, you know. And these are two different, completely 180 degrees apart discussions. So as an industry provider, what I noticed is, of course, people have the technology, have invested in the technology, but there is serious lack of knowledge on this aspect. So that's where I think the earlier panel's discussion of lack of talent comes into picture. And it is true, by the way. The basics of electricity is lost when you actually put in uh, or club it together with mechanical and plumbing, right? So that's why I always keep telling people, please, electrical engineering is different from all the other streams of engineering. Everything ranging from your body to what is flying above your head, everything has electricity. You know, but when you, when you want to handle electricity, you need to know the basics. So I would like to recorrect what they said. There is lack of basic talent or I would say basic skill, you know, rather than that. So if we are able to, uh, you know, teach and evolve them into understanding and re-understanding the basics, I think that would solve the problem, point number one. Second is when generation and consumption are connected together, you know, we are talking about the complete uh, electrical ecosystem. So when I was doing my BE, you know, I was uh, actually taught generation, transmission, distribution, and then comes the consumption, you know. So now we are talking everything packed into one. So I feel that from a design point of view, from the industry point of view, this becomes a very niche market for the complete basics to be put in. Yeah. So that's one of the learnings that I've had. With electric vehicle and electric vehicle charging, what they was done is just tip of the iceberg. So we're talking about AC charging, then DC charging. So when you talk about something like your laptop or the charges that you do, every car comes with that, which is called level one charging. You know, it, it has no, uh, there is no intelligence, there is no integration, it just gives power. But when you go into commercial applications, you, know, you need to have level two charging. It's the same AC charger with might be a SIM card built in. There's a communication module. There are standards for that, by the way. People don't even realize that there are standards for those. Just like how your mobile phones you know, communicate uh, through protocols, there are specific standards for chargers as well. You know? uh, once you know the basics of those standards, you know, then the smart charging can happen. You can enable it. Somebody like Deva can implement the chargers. You can start using them. You can know how many charge sessions have happened. You know, something similar to your electric meter that happens at home. You know? And then comes the, uh, you know, the, I would say the fastest or ultra fast charging right now uh, that we are discussing, which is anything about 50 kilowatt. So when, if we talk about 7 to 22 kilowatt in AC charging, we're talking about 50 to 150 kilowatt standard. You'll be surprised that that's just, again, tip of the iceberg. The industry is now moving towards 360 kilowatt standard, you know, because all the cars need faster charging. And now for trucks, cars, buses, uh, you know, all of them have been electrified, right? So now trucks, planes, boats, and yachts, you know, that is going to be megawatt charging that's going to be coming in, you know, which is talking about 3.75 megawatt being pumped into a single vehicle, you know. So that's the evolution of the EV charging that's also happening. Again, going back to the basics, if there is no engineer who, who I mean, if there is no engineer who knows what is 
high voltage medium voltage and so on you going to end up with a disaster so that's where the knowledge of uh, of a good electric engineers comes into picture and you know in solar and ev do complement or will get complemented with good electrical engineers so just i'm mean, closing my thought from there thank you abhilash uh, another important portfolio that you hold uh, is smart buildings so can you just outline you know what are the challenges uh, today in terms of smart buildings and how uh, renewable energy is something which is uh, endeavor to be integrated with smart buildings oh very good question sir you know see people when we talk about smart building right till now everyone's been talking about inside the building you know so a smart uh, uh, i would say hvac a smart sensor based lighting systems but people don't realize that the electricity for all those also comes from outside the building you know uh, and that's where uh, you know i didn't want to say intelligent building you know it's uh, it's a smart building because solar be it solar be it ev charging outside at your parking lots or be it your electricity at home uh, that is being used here or your phones that are being charged all of them you know can be planned intelligently so that the entire system becomes uh, more efficient right so that's where the smart building as a concept comes in so it can one technology make that happen of course not so different technologies have to come together at the protocol level to actually make this happen so just like how we are talking about just uh, you know outside the building ev and solar which are both electrical systems independent you know imagine if this happens at the building level i'll give you an example you know the, when i was working in india we had actually uh, proposed one technology for niti aayog at the time so the way it works is you have solar on the roof you have an ev charger at the bottom and it's a high rise building you know and then you have something like pumped hydro you know anyway you're going to be pumping water up right into high rise buildings why not use that as a storage technology you know in that case your entire system becomes more efficient you don't have to give large battery banks you know just to provide that energy and with pumped hydro you can also do uh, the concept of microgrid that we've been talking about uh, off grid systems can also be enabled and the same system that's working off grid will also be the most efficient during on grid applications you know so when you talk about it from a concept level all this makes sense right but when you talk about it from an electrical point of view it's the worst electrical engineers nightmare you know so and coming from a concept uh, creator or the guy who's been handling this i feel that we are still a bit too early for smart building as a concept but when all these technologies evolve to that level you know i think that's when the smart technology or smart building as a technology will come into picture the, it's a buzzword a lot of people use it but it's really a smart technology when all these technologies inside and outside work together so hope that answers your question very interesting thank you abhilash uh, abhinav uh, you come with a background of you know uh, uh, temporary uh, power solutions in uh, solar hybrid and you know gas based uh, you know uh, power solutions so you know of late uh, there is an increased endeavor uh, to replace conventional uh, temporary power solutions like uh, you know the diesel based or any you know uh, it could be petrol based uh, power solutions to a more renewable temporary uh, power solutions so uh, you know what's your uh, views in terms of the current uh, trends in temporary power solutions in renewables uh, thanks shrimant uh, very very framed and very sensible question thanks for this uh, in my last 20 years two decades um, in my journey i have started from conventional you know diesel based power solutions tailor made power solutions back in uh, you know late 90s when people have a big confusion about a generator i would like to go at a, you know right from the basic what is a generator so generator is a emergency you know power supply solutions so we start educating the you know the user that guy this is not a standby this is a 5400 hours continuous duty rated operated generator can be used and can be a part of your process so then people said oh no i mean it can work only for you know couple of you know, like 2 300 hours uh, a year then we start you know educating the people then in my journey i started you know getting into i was in gujarat so we started uh, when i was working with doits mwm so uh, i would like to share one of my experience with the uh, our honorable prime minister of india when he was the chief minister of gujarat uh, respected narendra modi ji 
So he came to Power Gen Ahmedabad and you know he was talking about what you're up to. He said we are giving a gas based power solution. Okay, what is that? So I said it's required gas. Uh, so he said, he just asked their, you know, guys, some IES officers with them. He said, guys, do we have gas in Gujarat? So there is no gas. Okay. So can I have some gas? I can store the gas. They said, yes, you can capsulate the gas. So what I need to say is that those were the days when the customer was very innocent. Customer doesn't know anything. So we need to educate the customer. But now, customer know everything. So that's the difference I would like to share upon. Because of the social media, because of the internet, the problem here, this is a problem, so there's an, I wanted to raise a flag, when customer, your user knows everything, it's become more difficult to give a right solution to them. So I am coming from this power generation background now, what we are doing at present, we are actually providing a tailor-made, as I mentioned that, you know, tailor-made, Customized solution for rental. Uh, people say that it's a built, operate, own, built, operate, own, and transfer. So we need to say that you know uh, the topic which is given it is very, very interesting. You know, design. So designing is nothing but uh, being an engineer. Designing is sizing and selection of whatever you do, right? So uh, in that, I mean, you know, and then you talk about procurement, the next stage of it. So we say that guys, do you have the right sizing selection? So as uh, Abhilash rightly mentioned, you know, from the engineering days when we, we used to learn generation to transmission to distribution and to the use. So I am from a background from energy meter solutions also. So we used to say, guys, what are your losses? So we need to quantify the loss. We are talking about big PV solutions, solar solutions. No, guys, let's understand, you know, the, the pain area. What are the losses you've been incurred to increase the efficiency? So the point is that how we can reduce, you know, the consumption and increase the efficiency of our process. So that's the real challenge we need to educate. And in UAE, not only in UAE, but entire world, we need to tell the guys a power, which either you get it from a grid or from solar, it costs to you. So either it's a capex or an opex. So it's cost to you some money, maybe right from, you know, 30 fills to 45 fills or you know, 0.5 dollar to whatever, you know. So all I need to say is that at this time, we really need to get into the pain area of the customer, of the user, be it be a process industry, be it be a manufacturing plant. And uh, you know, I, I was in UK, so I see that offshore solutions, what uh, this gentleman was providing. So everything, even the distribution companies nowadays, if you see Diva, take an example, they are they are joining hand with a lot of Chinese companies and they are going phase-wise with 500 plus megawatts. So even the distributing companies and the policies are going, you know, and in my last discussions what I heard that Dubai is only the place where nobody can stop you. Whatever is your, your brain, please deliver it. Guys, prove yourself, take the money, show the benefits. So this is what I, I strongly feel. So if we all can think in this direction to to educate the customer in the right way as a, as a consultant. So we have to act as a consultant, you know, a freelance consultant, so that, you know, we become a part of their solution. Yeah, okay. thanks. Thank you, Avinav. So, uh, Asim, uh, you come from a very uh, diversified background of handling more than 2,000 projects. I'm sure you've seen multiple challenges. And, yes, sir. And, and with sure. multiple challenges, I'm sure your experience is quite enriched. So, I'm, I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, project is deemed successful only when it gives us the required, uh, you know, uh, generation and uh, the financial model is kept intact. End of the day, it is all, you know, the, the returns over investment, right? So, tell us more about how you will ensure during the operations and maintenance of the plants, you will ensure uh, the best profitabilities. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, it's a very nice question and query. Uh, first of all, I will introduce what we do, what we do actually. We are a ch chemical manufacturing company for last 40 years and uh, in last 7, 8 years we are making, uh, giving solutions for solar, which is a chemical, a range of chemicals actually which are for the solar systems and the solar modules and the solar plants. And uh, since 2015, 
we started this and I am the head for this technical uh, development and everything of the product. So I had to take care of every aspect of the solar plant. Now what happened that people started putting solar systems on the rooftop or ground mounted or open access, whatever. Whatever the fund capacity and whatever the requirement, people started with that. Then what happened that uh, after some time, they faced a problem that now the generation is not coming due to the atmospheric dust, due to the atmos uh, industrial dust or due to any factor. But the entire engineering past was intact, neither there was issue with the inverter, neither there was issue with any cable, neither there was issue with the modules. But taking this as challenge, then we introduced ourselves. Uh, the first plot which we did was in India in Rajasthan, in uh, Kharia. And uh, from there the journey started and uh, gradually we did several projects with uh, Tata, Adani, Renew Power, Clean Tech, Clean Max, then uh, Acme. Uh, you name the company and we are there because we are the single module manufacturer, chemical manufacturing company having an organic product which does not damages the module. So. We have seen various things in the market like when there was a scenario that Oriano was to hand over the 10 megawatt system to MP Builder Group. Entire plant was with cement dust and the generation was dropped by 80% and there was no solution. We were called there and then we started working on it. Same where every company has their some critical areas, some critical projects which worked with each and every company. I can say that people knows us. Just to, uh, to again uh, regain the generation back to uh, 1991 PR. In this duration, we have also come across with several projects which are op of open access. People say that there is a problem of soiling and now we cannot uh, get the back generation which you used to get uh, when the plant was installed. But it was not like that. We worked with Veena Energy, we worked with uh, uh, several uh, big uh, MNCs in India and abroad and we again regained the generation back to normal as it was installed. So there is nothing like soiling, it is just uh, people think that now we cannot get it but it's not like that. So we work in that manner sir. Thank you, thank you uh, Haseem. So from a design perspective, you know, uh, what do you think, you know, uh, certain things that could be, uh, you know, ensured at the time of inception of the project so that you know the projects do get delivered uh, with with highest quality and then it will eventually end up in a very efficient operations and maintenance so this is a big question and uh, i will elaborate something with my experience design part, part is very very important if the design is not up to the mark according to the industry or according to the atmosphere the entire project is going into vain I will take an example of one Tata project which is at Parayagraj. They have a 50 megawatt site just between a cement plant and a power plant. So what is there? The entire plant is in a uh, way that all the modules are horizontal, not straight, but they are vertical, sorry. And we say it, it is a portrait form. So and uh, uh, beneath that they have taken a uh, shield of uh, iron structure which should not have been there because now that structure is damaging the entire system because all the dust which comes on the module gets on that structure and now that structure is getting rusted. Now another issue is there. Same is the cases with several floating systems we have come across because people do make the floating systems but they do not make the provisions how to clean them because when a system is there on the water, so the water vapor and the dust gets accumulated on the system. Now there is no provision to go there and no provision to clean it properly. So that is another challenge with the floating system. So designing part is very important into this. Same is the case with several rooftops where the modules are not approachable. Just you have put on the rooftop, there are no walking tracks, no skylighter highlighted. So the designing part has to be taken care of very well because after coming to such a number of uh, locations, uh, we, we can, though we are not from that background, but we can definitely design a system <laughs> that how it should be. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. So, <clears throat> Rahul, uh, you, you come from a background where you are betting big on uh, uh, floating offshore uh, platforms and off offshore renewable systems. Sure. So, 
this is something which is technologically quite uh, new and challenging. And on the other side, you know, we keep hearing, uh, you know, the, the various uh, climate change events, uh, rise in the sea levels, etc. So, so given this, uh, you know, change in uh, the climatic conditions and the kind of solutions you are offering, can you just outline on, you know, how your technology is constantly evolving uh, to try and, you know, mitigate risks like this? Okay. So, uh, first I will tell you, uh, so my background, I'm a naval architect and you know what a naval architect is doing in a solar conference. Uh, the reason is uh, this new emerging technology which is floating solar. Uh, uh, as of now, there are about 3 gigawatt, about 3 gigawatt of installation, uh, in, in t like floating solar installation around the world. A majority of them are in China and then uh, also Europe as well as Southeast Asia and obviously uh, in UAE we have a lot of uh, land is not a issue so we have uh, uh, just a very small uh, floating solar uh, plant uh, 100 kV uh, 100 kilowatt peak which was uh, installed back in 2020 so uh, but but again so i will tell you uh, about uh, uh, the technology first and why it is uh, catching up it is also called as the third pillar of solar energy uh, the reason is one because we talk about panel efficiency, right? All the time we are uh, working on the panel technology to increase ef efficiency. So when you put a solar uh, plant on water, floating on water, uh, the studies say that the panel efficiency, the, the efficiency of the plant goes by about, up by about 10%. So that's a, a big number. Second thing is, uh, second advantage of floating solar is uh, in terms of uh, uh, land because it does not need any land so it makes a lot of sense for countries like India, Indonesia, very highly densely populated countries where uh, you know uh, solar is always competing with agricultural land. Uh, this is another advantage. For, for let's say, let's talk about UAE. So another advantage floating solar offer is uh, you know, uh, it reduces the evaporation of water. So it makes a lot of sense uh, to uh, cover the entire reservoir or any natural lake uh, with floating solar farms. So it reduces the water evaporation. So countries like UAE, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so these are basically uh, the reasons why floating solar is catching up. Another thing which, uh, uh, which, uh, which uh, we can talk about, another advantage is like, you know, shading losses because uh, there are very minimum shading losses uh, because obviously it's installed in the open uh, sea or a reservoir where there are not many buildings or other structures around it. And uh, again, uh, we were talking about the dust, so that again is uh, reduced in floating solar panels. So uh, I see uh, the projected, uh, uh, the rate at which the industry is moving, it's about 20% every year and it's projected to be at 30 gigawatt, uh, which is a high estimate for 2030. Uh, so, so I basically see it as a, a really growing technology which has to come to UAE as well and again I'll, I'll give you a very brief background about Invent Ocean. It's a very new company uh, founded in 2020 by me and uh, so far what we have done is we have uh, uh, engineered station keeping systems for uh, about 150 megawatt of floating solar plants. And uh, also we are now developing technology for uh, offshore uh, floating solar. So this is a very challenging aspect of floating solar when you move offshore because now you have very high uh, waves and you know, uh, the offshore environment obviously is not same as what you have uh, in the ground mounted, right? So there are many challenges, which is what we are working on. I'm working on some pilot projects with some big companies in Southeast Asia who are testing very small systems and uh, uh, so what we offer is we uh, offer engineering, uh, you know, we carry out simulations of these plants and waves, how they are going to behave, what is going to be the motion of uh, the platforms and everything. Uh, my, like, again, so I come from an EPCI background as well, but that was from offshore, uh, EP, uh, offshore oil and gas EPCI background. So uh, since we are talking about EPCI, it's very challenging for an EPCI contractor uh, to also, you know, develop a, f a floating solar plant. Uh, the reason is because each site is very different. You know, you uh, are going to install these plants in reservoirs which have very undulating seabed, I would say, right? And then there are water tanks or, you know, man-made reservoirs which have very flat seabed. So uh, the topography everywhere is very different. 
the contractors, uh, since this is a new field, they, so they do not understand uh, what challenges they will face uh, when they are actually developing the project. Uh, some of the projects, uh, that, that's where, like for example, in one of the projects in India, which uh, uh, was there, which is a 100 megawatt uh, Ramagundam floating solar project, for which I designed the mooring and anchoring. We ended up with a very, very big anchors. So I will tell you about uh, the floating solar system, how it works is you have this large, uh, you know, about 2.5 to 3 megawatt island. The area would be about 200 meter by 200 meter. And usually they are made up of HTPE floats. And they are floating on, uh, on, on the water surface. But again, if anything is floating, it is also going to be moving uh, because of uh, wind and waves and, uh, you know, other uh, like cur currents, etc. So uh, you have to moor them somehow, like, you know, you have to tie it with ropes and you have to place anchor blocks on the seabed or even uh, the uh, piles where anchoring, uh, where, where the blocks are not possible. So, so that increases the EPCI cost, obviously. Uh, the, the prices for uh, floating solar is about 20% more than ground mounted. But again, it's very site specific. Some sites where there is uh, uh, challenges in terms of, let's say, water uh, variation. Uh, uh, because, you know, floating solar is also being installed in uh, sites where hydroelectric dam sites, right? Yeah. And this is, that makes a lot of sense because there is already infrastructure available, the grid connectivity is there. Uh, but the challenges in these dam sites is, uh, huge water level variation. So uh, I'm working on a site currently where the water depth at highest water level is about 90 meter. And uh, at the lowest water level, when the water level goes down, it's about 45 meters. So there is a variation of 45 meter. Okay. Uh, so as the water level goes down, uh, you, are, you have connected the solar plant with ropes. They become slack. Uh, you know, they are not tight anymore. The system is not any tight anymore. So the plant moves a lot. So these are the challenges which uh, we are uh, developing technology to overcome these challenges and also to reduce the prices of uh, floating solar plants. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raul.